WPSU is your source for Penn State sports, Penn State research, Penn State community. But we can't do it without your support. Make a contribution today and get a DVD of your favorite Penn State show. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was you don't ever say to her that what about the shock when the United Nations is we left more of a community we're trying to back over doing in autism his life is the stuff of movies. In fact, one was made about him. Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story, tells how a hot-tempered inner-city kid from a broken home overcomes all odds to become a renowned pediatric neurosurgeon. In 1987, he made medical history when he separated conjoined twins joined at the head. Now the director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Children's Center and 2008 Presidential Medal of Freedom winner, he dedicates his spare time to cultivating future leaders. We talked with Carson about his work and philanthropy, his thoughts on health care reform, and about what's still on his to-do list. Here's our conversation with Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Ben Carson, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Among other things, you focus your practice on traumatic brain injuries, brain and spinal cord tumors, neurological and congenital disorders, including separating conjoined twins, and uh, trigeminal neuralgia, which is sometimes referred to as the suicide disease because yes. it's so painful. Why neurology and why specifically pediatric neurology? Well, you know, I always was interested in medicine. It was the only thing that interested me as a kid. and. Uh, you know, when I entered college, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. When I entered medical school, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. So I, I loved the brain. Um, and as time went on, I realized I loved the tangible aspects of the brain even more than I did the intangible aspects. And also that that was where my talents were. You know, I had a, a great deal of eye-hand coordination, the ability to think in three dimensions. I was a very careful person, never knocked things over and said, oops, which is a great characteristic for a brain surgeon, by the way. So um, all of those things seem to be pointing me in that direction. And I started out as an adult neurosurgeon, but uh, I developed an affinity for the kids because, you know, with kids, what you see is what you get. When they feel good, you know they feel good. When they feel bad, you know they feel bad. And you can spend enormous amounts of time operating on a kid. And uh, if you're successful, your reward may be 40, 50, 60 years of life. You don't get that with adults. So I get a big return on my investment. Now, not that long ago, your caseload was as many as 500 surgeries a year. You've cut back in recent years. Um, that was twice the caseload of a typical neurosurgeon. Why so many? Well, for one thing, it's because I was pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> and you were it. I was it. And now, you know, there are four of us. Uh, so, which is good because I was, I was working way too hard. There's no question about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I still uh, do plenty and have an opportunity to be involved in a lot more, uh, not only neurosurgical cases, but other outside activities, which is wonderful. What's plenty, by the way? Uh, Can I you put a number on it? Yeah, I still do 300, 350 cases a year. Now, this is coming from someone who describes himself as a hot-tempered kid uh, growing up in a single-parent family in inner-city Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, you became the, the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at John Hopkins at the age of 33, which I think would have been remarkable for anyone, but especially remarkable for someone who came from your background. How did you do it? Well, uh, I had help. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that I think uh, my mother uh, instilled in me and in my brother was a sense of responsibility. Uh, she had an incredibly difficult life herself. You know, one of 24 children got married when she was 13, found out her husband was a bigamist, had only a third grade education, but she never became a victim. And she never felt sorry for herself. And she never felt sorry for us. And she never let us feel sorry for ourselves. And she always said, you know, do you have a brain? And if you have a brain, then you're fine. It doesn't really matter what's going on out there. And you can deal with it. 
And uh, so were there obstacles along the way? Absolutely. Were there people telling me, you can't do this? Of course there were. Did I listen to them? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> you described it as, as the no excuses household, which I think is absolutely remarkable that your mother, as you said, with a third grade education, had the wisdom yes. to require the kinds of things that she did from you and your brother. Right, and, and that was it. You know, she was a good observer. And uh, because she worked as a domestic, cleaning other people's houses, and she would work two or three jobs at a time because she didn't want to be on welfare. Um, because she noticed that she never saw anybody go on welfare and come off of it, and she didn't want that life for her or for, our, or for us. Uh, but she would observe in those homes of very successful people what they did, and then she would bring that home. What they did was read. Right. She was working in homes where there were lots of books. There were lots of books. They read, they planned, they strategized. They had vast uh, uh, amounts of knowledge about all kinds of things. They didn't sit around watching TV all day, drinking and playing games. And uh, she said, that's what people do in our neighborhood. And then she would take us to the places where she worked. And she would say, now, you have a choice. You can do what people do in our neighborhood, and you can stay there. Or you can do what people do in this neighborhood, and you can go there. You said that growing up, you hated your neighborhood, you hated the environment, uh, you were angry, but you knew at some point this is temporary. Right. Well, it was one, once I started doing a lot of reading, um, I stopped hating poverty quite as much because I knew by reading stories of people like Booker T. Washington, who was born a slave, it was illegal to read, but he taught himself to read anyway, read everything in sight, became an advisor to presidents. And I began to realize that the person who has the most to do with you is you. It's not the environment, and it's not somebody else. And as I began to understand that, I realized that I didn't have to remain in that neighborhood. I didn't have to remain in that state, that I could change it to whatever I wanted it to be. And at that point, it didn't bother me anymore because I knew it was temporary. But here you were, a kid. Uh, you weren't on welfare, but your family did use medical assistance. And, and you recalled times when you would sit in the waiting room, in the hall, waiting for your turn. Um, but you loved that environment. You, did you, despite the fact that you didn't weren't necessarily showing that you had what it took to become a neurosurgeon as a, as a young kid. Right. You, you love that environment. Well, I, lo I love the, the hospital environment. And, you know, sitting in the hallways and listening to the PA system, it was just exciting to me. It was thrilling seeing doctors walking by with charts with their stethoscopes around their neck and hearing them being paged. All of that just excited me. And I just said, yeah, this is, this is where I belong. So you had to imagine yourself there, even when, um, as, a, as a young child, you say you were considered the class dummy. You, you right. even used to say to your mother, I'm not smart. Right. Well, you know, I was, I was like a lot of kids are. You know, you ask them, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And they'll say, oh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be, you know, this President. or that or the other. Uh, but you look at their list of achievements and they're not very impressive, but somehow they think magically it's going to happen. Well, I was the same way, but in my case, magically it did happen. But it wasn't really magic, it was a lot of work behind it. That's right. In fact, preparation, uh, you, you underscore the importance of preparation and it's absolutely critical in what you do. I'm thinking of, uh, especially in your early days, mm -hmm. uh, separating conjoined twins, conjoined twins who were, who were joined at the head in a, in a first time ever surgery that required a team of 77 right. uh, personnel um, and 22 hours on your feet. What kind of preparation goes into that? Well, uh, well, first of all, these were occipital craniopagus joined at the back of the head, and none of those had ever been successfully separated before because they share all the major blood drainage systems of the brain, and so they tend to exsanguinate or bleed to death. And uh, so obviously I did a lot of studying about not only those kinds of twins, but other kinds of twins, because there have been some other types of twins that had been successfully separated. Um, and then thinking about some of the techniques that we used in craniofacial surgery, 
talking to some of the cardiovascular surgeons about ways to stop blood flow uh, and just putting all that together into a plan. So, and it was very much like what I had done for a number of other complex types of cases. I, I was at that point in my career doing all kinds of pretty amazing things um, that most people wouldn't do. Um, and it wasn't because I would do anything. It was because I had a lot of people around me who were brilliant and I was taking advantage of them. I would pick their brains. I'd say, well, what do you think about this? And find out, uh, you know, you can, you can make a lot of progress if you, you know, walk on the back of people who've already made some progress and you just keep putting all those little stones together and pretty soon you make a bridge. It is interesting, though, that many of your most pioneering accomplishments happened very early in your career. Yes. Is that typical, or, or I mean, is that is that youth and boldness? Well, and well, actually, if you stop and you think about it, you look at people, for instance, who win Nobel prizes in science and mathematics. They usually don't get them until they're in their fifties or sixties, but it's for work they did when they were in their twenties and thirties. You know, this this is the, the the most productive part of your life because you've got lots of energy, and you know, like boundless enthusiasm. Um, now, you know, if I were starting out today at age 58, there's no way I would do a lot of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I don't have the energy to do that anymore or the desire, quite frankly. But, you know, then it is very, very exciting. And, and that's why I tell young people all the time, I said, now is the time. I said, don't be sitting around thinking, oh, well, in 10 years, I'll do this, and then 15 years. Don't do that. Now is the time. Prepare yourself. Use that enthusiasm. Use that energy. Focus on stuff. Make it happen. You look, you look at Bill Gates. You know, stuff that he did, he did that in his 20s. And a lot of other people, Steve Jobs, all of those people, even though they, you know, they're sitting pretty right now, they did that stuff when they were in their 20s. So uh, that's a good time to to use that energy effectively. Well, what does that say to a physician? I hope you won't mind if I say, I think you're 58 years old. 18% mm -hmm. um, of, the, of the practicing physicians in this country, uh, 18 or 19% are 65 or older, and they do have a different view. In fact, many of them are retiring, and in something like uh, neurosurgery, which requires uh, stamina and, and, and unbelievable and, eye-hand coordination, right. Um, what, what does that mean? Well, they tend to retire earlier. Um, it used to be that neurosurgeons retired generally around 65. Now it's about 10 years earlier than that. Not so much that there's been a decrement in their abilities as it is. It's very difficult, particularly in private practice now, to be able to pay the malpractice premiums. So. You're the second most sued specialty, is that right? It, neurosurgery. It's either first or second. It's neurosurgery and, and OB. And uh, people used to start slowing down when they hit about 50. And just, you know, kind of take it easy over the next 10 to 15 years before they fully retire. And now you can't do that because if you've got to pay these enormous malpractice premiums, you just can't slow down. So it, it, there comes a point when you're, you know, 55 or so, you say, you know, I can keep working like a madman or I can retire. And a lot of people are choosing to retire. There, there are some <laughs> studies that suggest that, that slowing down actually may be worse for a, a, an aging surgeon or physician. Well, there are some studies that indicate everything. <laughs> well, that's true, too. <laughs> but, uh, but the fact of the matter is we are losing some, some tremendous talent earlier than we should be losing it. There's no question about that. And it's something that, you know, as a society, we really do need to deal with it. That brings us to, uh, to health care. I know when, uh, uh, when Hillary Clinton um, devised health care reform, you weren't a fan. I'd like to know why and what you would describe as uh, critical ingredients to real health care reform. Yeah. Well, you know, the key thing is, I don't know anybody who doesn't think health care reform shouldn't be done. It is absolutely crucial, and it should be available to everybody, and the costs should be reasonable. 
Now having said that, the question is how do we get there? Uh, we certainly don't get there by throwing more money at the problem. We already spend more than twice as much per capita on health care as the next closest nation in the world. So what that tells me is that we're putting plenty, plenty of money into the system. We're just not using it very efficiently. As I like to say, there are too many hogs feeding at the trough of the health care dollar. So what I would uh, suggest, you know, rather than spending a lot of time criticizing what other people have suggested, is I would suggest some real measures uh, to get costs under control, such as, you know, billing and collections. Uh, you know, we spend enormous amounts. Uh, most practices spend somewhere between 20 and 30 percent on billing and collections, okay? And it's not necessary because every single diagnosis has something known as an ICD-9 code. Every procedure has something known as a CPT code, and we have computers, which means all billing and collection can be done instantaneously, electronically, without generating all those mountains of papers and armies of people to push them around. Completely unnecessary at a fraction of the cost. Now, you know, some insurance companies and others would say, well, if it were that easy, then a healthcare practitioner could simply say, well, I did two appendectomies. Let me just enter that when they only did one and get paid twice. And who would know the difference? Well, first of all, there are very few people that I've ever met who would even consider such a thing. I mean, that's ridiculous. But there are some. The solution to that is not to build a gigantic bureaucracy that's very costly. The solution is what I call the Saudi Arabian solution. Why don't people still in Saudi Arabia? You cut their hand off. <laughs> you think you're not serious. <laughs> well, I wouldn't cut their hand off, okay? But there would be some real teeth in, right. the, in the punishment. You know, you'd lose your license to practice forever. That's not what happens now? No. You go to jail for no less than 10 years, and you would lose all your personal assets. Not only would no one cheat, but everybody would check every bill seven ways to Sunday to make sure it was correct. It would not be an issue. It's sort of like, you know, why don't people drive drunk in Sweden? They like alcohol just as much as we do. But the penalties for drunk driving are so severe that it's part of the culture. You wouldn't even think about it. And it's the same thing that would happen there. So not big bureaucracy, just real teeth in the rules. That would reduce the cost dramatically. The other thing that would reduce it dramatically is making the government responsible for catastrophic health care. Now, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the government shouldn't be responsible. They can't do anything right. But that's not exactly true. The government has done a number of things uh, that have helped all of us. For instance, the reason we can can own our home, homes is because we have homeowner's insurance. Now, we wouldn't be able to get homeowner's insurance if there were no government agency known as FEMA. But because your insurance company would say, well, there may be a hurricane, there may be an earthquake, there may be this, that, and the other. So we have to be prepared for all those things, and the premiums would just skyrocket, and you'd have to have that through your employer, too. Well, it's the same kind of analogy with health care. If government's responsible for catastrophic health care and insurance companies are only responsible for routine health care, now it's going to be pretty easy to predict what they're going to have to put out and what they need to take in. And uh, they can be regulated just like the utilities are regulated. If, if we didn't regulate utilities, I guarantee you they'd be finding all kind of reasons why the cost of your water and your electricity should be a lot more than it is. And of course, um, there's deregulation <laughs> happening in, in a lot of states. That we'll, exactly. see, we'll see what will happen. But that, that would, again, dramatically reduce the cost. And the, the ideal would be to get the cost down to the point where people could afford their own insurance. They wouldn't have to have it through their employer. And uh, that's going to do wonders for job creation, by the way. But, um, but also, if, if you own your own health insurance, I can say to you, if you get an annual physical exam, you get a 2 to 3% discount. So you're incentivized to get that annual exam. We catch stuff early. A whole nother level of savings. We need to start talking about wellness and preventive care. This is where we're really going to save enormous amounts of money. And then what about the 47 million people who don't have health insurance, or the 40, or the 30, or the 15, or the 12, or whatever number it right. is. You know, first of all, they don't exist. Because they can go to the emergency room, where they have to be taken care of, 
It costs five times more to take care of them there than it would in the clinic. So what we should be saying is, look, we're paying for them anyway, but we're paying premium dollars. So let's figure out a way to pay for them with economical dollars. Let's find a way to encourage them to go to the clinic rather than to the emergency room. And uh, well, I would use again another government program as an example, the food stamp program. Why don't people starve to death in this country? Because we have a food stamp program. They get a monthly allocation and they learn very quickly not to go out the first five days and buy porterhouse steak. They learn to, you know, proportion things out over the course of the month. People would do the same thing if we had an electronic health account that was replenished each month. Now when Mr. Brown gets that diabetic foot ulcer, instead of going to the emergency room, he's going to go to the clinic because he doesn't want to blow half of his budget that one night. And, uh, you know, he gets the same treatment in both places, but the difference is in the emergency room, they patch him up and send him out. And, and the, that's it. That's Until it. Until the next Until crisis. he comes back. Right. And in the clinic, they patch him up and they say, now, let, Mr. Brown, let's get your diabetes under control so you're not back here in three weeks with another problem. A whole nother level of savings. These are intelligent and logical ways to get the cost down and to, 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 to create the kind of environment that will allow everybody to have, you know, excellent health care in, in, in a system that, by the way, is second to none. What we have to do is just uh, apply a little logic to the system. And the reason a lot of these things aren't being done, the very things that I'm talking about, they're very logical. Anybody can understand that they would make sense. Anything that's done that comes out of Washington that doesn't make sense, it's because of the fourth branch of government. Which is? Special interest groups. <laughs> <laughs> Which has really become the most powerful. And when you really want to stop and think about it, how did they become so powerful? It's because, believe it or not, we distorted what was a extraordinarily good system that was set up by our founding fathers, a representative government. They planned it so that teachers, janitors, dog catchers, pharmacists, nurses, would go to Congress as representatives of their communities for a couple of years, making sure that their constituency was heard, and then go back. And then somebody else would come. And then somebody else would come. That's not but the now, working. now we've created a situation where you have these lifetime politicians, and of course, they're worried about getting reelected every couple of years, which makes the special interest groups incredibly important. So we're, we've kind of distorted uh, the, the plan, and that's why we're suffering the consequences. Now, you have obviously a, a, a can-do attitude, but I'm wondering how optimistic you are that the kind of health care uh, that you've described or, or something even comparable could pass. Oh, I know, I know it could pass. Um, the problem is getting it out there. And, you know, the establishment uh, isn't all that interested, to be honest with you, in alternatives. Uh, I have found that out. They're just not that interested in them. And, um, you know, I guess... So what, the status quo is... Yeah, I guess what you'd have to do is almost declare yourself a candidate and run, which I'm not particularly interested in doing, but one of the things that, that I've noticed in studying our, our government and our government structure is that they are deathly afraid of real change. I know, for instance, the current president ran on change. And people actually do want change, but as you can see, nothing has changed. And, and nothing will because, you know, whether it's Democrat or whether it's Republican, you know, there's a certain order of things. Uh, and a certain way that things are done um, that serves their purposes and not necessarily the purposes of the people. I had a little glimmer of you, you've thought about politics. Well, many people have told me that I really should do it. Um, but, you know, the thing that really is most important to me right now is, is working with the next generation and, and getting them prepared and, and maybe creating the right kind of leadership out of them 
And one of the things I know is that if I go into the political arena, I automatically will eliminate half of my audience from one side or the other side. So, and you know, that won't work well for the kids. And the kids uh, are an enormous focus of your energies these days. Uh, there's the Carson Scholars, uh, the Angels of the OR. Tell us first about Carson Scholars, which is now in what, 32 states? 34 states. 34 states. Yes. Well, you know, some years ago, uh, I was reading a statistic looking at the ability of our eighth grade equivalents to solve math and science problems. Uh, there were 22 countries involved, and we ranked number 21 out of 22. Did they did they calculate it the same way we do, though? Yes. <laughs> no. Yes, it was standardized. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife and I became very alarmed, and we said, "What what does this mean for the future of our nation?" And we said, "We have to do something about this." So we. Started giving out $1,000 scholarships to students starting in the fourth grade. Initially, we just paid out of our own pocket, who demonstrated tremendous uh, academic prowess and also humanitarian qualities. They had to show that they cared about other people. Because we don't want people who were just smart but selfish, because that's how we got in the mess we are in now. And, you know, we try to put them on the same kind of pedestal as we do the all-state basketball players and the all-state wrestlers because those are the people who get all the attention at, in our schools. The, the uh, smart kids are, you know, they're nerds and geeks and nobody gives two hoots and a holler about them. So not only does the school get a big trophy that goes out with all the other sports trophies, but the kid gets to wear a medal. They go to a banquet. They get uh, pr local press attention. And, uh, you know, it makes a, a huge difference. And uh, we started at giving out scholarships 14 years ago. We gave out 25 scholarships in Baltimore. And, of course, it's grown very rapidly. And now, as, as you mentioned, we're in 34 states with almost 4,000 scholars and uh, continuing to rapidly expand. And now these kids can, can earn a $1,000 scholarship they can, they can earn one from fourth grade through twelfth grade. Correct. So by the time they're ready for college, there's some money there. Right. It's interesting that you are focusing on fourth graders because so many other scholarship programs, they focus in on uh, juniors school. and seniors. Right. And the reason for that is because, you know, it's, it's like a road and it begins to diverge. And we find that fourth, fifth grade, that's about where the divergence starts. So. You know, if you're trying to reach them by the time they've gotten to high school, you've already missed the boat in, in half the cases. And, you know, this is so incredibly important because we have got to vastly increase the pool of academically competent people. You know, we produce 60,000 engineers a year, 40% of whom are foreigners. China produces 392,000 engineers a year, and this is the technological age, the information age. We're going to fall so far behind, we were going to be totally incapable of competing in the future. And I think we have maybe one more generation to fix this problem. One of the things that your scholarship focuses on um, is also creating reading rooms. Reading was, uh, was really your lifeline. It broadened your horizons. It, exactly. it allowed you to escape. Um, and we should mention that your mother required that you turn off the TV and that you read two books a week and, and actually submit a report to her at a right. time when, when she, couldn't she couldn't even read, read your report. That's correct. Um, so tell us about these reading rooms and, and well, why that's so important. Well, first of all, most people would be shocked to learn that a large number, if not most, elementary and middle schools don't even have a library. And uh, I was shocked when I found that out. So we started putting in these reading rooms, and they're incredible places. Almost no little kid would pass it by. Uh, decorated, very fancy, with whimsical characters on the wall and bean bags, uh, uh, seats, and incredible books, very interesting books and the kids get points for the amount of time they spend in the reading room and for the number of books that they read. And they save them like S&H green stamps and they can trade them in for prizes and things. In the beginning they do it for the prizes but I gotta tell you it doesn't take very long before they really begin to understand how enjoyable reading is and that translates into much better academic performance. And also bear in mind that 70 to 80 percent of high school dropouts are functionally illiterate. So if we can truncate that problem early on, 
then we're going to have a lot more people graduating from high school and a lot more people going into college. And that's what we need to do. We need to backfill that, that great void uh, in order to be able to compete into the future. You know, I had dinner, my wife and I, with uh, Craig Barrett uh, some years ago, uh, who was the chairman of Intel. Uh, and he said they have to import almost all of their technological help from outside of this country because we don't produce enough people to do it. That was a very alarming statement. And uh, so, you know, we're working in several different venues right now, trying to work with the YMCA's and Boys and Girls Clubs too, uh, to figure out ways that we can create programs there for those 13 and a half million students who frequent those places after school instead of just arts and crafts and sports, maybe some real uh, interesting science and math projects. You're the poster child for uh, not enough hours in the day. How do you <laughs> maintain your practice, your family, you, you have a wife and three children, um, with the philanthropy? Well, you know, I always say if you need to have something done, you have to get somebody who's busy to do it because people who are not busy never have time to do anything because it takes them all day to do nothing. <laughs> but also, you know, I've been extraordinarily fortunate uh, to have wonderful people around me, uh, and that helps enormously to have someone trustworthy uh, who's effective. You know, I have, I have a wonderful wife of 34 years who helps me enormously. Uh, my senior physician assistant, uh, Carol James, has been with me uh, my entire career. Wow. She started when I was chief resident and joined me when I became a faculty member, has been with me from day one. Uh, you know, my office manager, Audrey Jones, um, many, many years with me. Uh, other secretarial staff have been with me for even longer. So, um, and my colleagues, I have some of the most wonderful colleagues imaginable. You know, when I say I need to go on Tuesday to uh, Penn State, no problem, come for you. No matter where. No matter what time, no matter how many times, no problem, we're happy to take care of it. And, you know, they are just excellent, so I don't have to worry about any uh, decreased, uh, you know, capability in terms of taking care of complex problems. So all of those things make it possible for me to do some of the other things I do. Now, you mentioned your wife, uh, Candy. Uh, you met her when you were at Yale. She's sure. an accomplished uh, musician. Um, and, and music, classical music, is an important, really important part of your life. Yes. Um, you were turned on to classical music as a teenager, That's which correct. I think is pretty incredible for a kid growing up in inner city Detroit. But um, tell us about classical music and your affinity well, for it. Well, the, the, the reason I became interested in it is because I wanted to be a contestant on GE College Bowl. And, uh, you know, not only did they ask questions about science and math and history and geography, but they also asked questions about classical art and classical music. And there I was in inner city high school in Detroit, and I, I knew the answers about the other stuff, but had no idea who, you know, Peter Paul Rubens or Gauguin or Telemann or all these people. And so I just said, I got to learn this stuff myself. So I was always listening to classical music because I had to get to the point where I could identify a piece in just a few seconds because I minutes. wanted to be a contestant on the program. <laughs> and they only play a couple of bars. So uh, that's, that's really how I got interested in it. And uh, it even had a, a, a huge impact on, on the college that I attended because I had enough money to apply to one college. And I said, I'm going to apply to the college that wins the grand championship in college bowl. And that year, the grand championship was between Harvard and Yale. And, uh, and Yale demolished Harvard, so I applied to Yale. And uh, fortunately, they accepted me with a scholarship. I, you know, I was kind of young and naive. I had no idea how foolish that was just to apply to one college and to that college to the <laughs> Yale. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it all worked out. And, um, and of course, even, uh, even, you know, not getting together with my wife. Uh, turned out to hinge on, you know, the music, the music connection. And there was a music connection even in your uh, acceptance into a highly prestigious um, residency program. That's right. That was, you were one of 153 candidates. Well, well, 125 candidates, and they took two a year. 
and so at Hopkins. And I wanted to go to Hopkins because that was a place that was best known for neurosurgery. But the odds of, of getting in obviously were slim. But when I went for my interview, uh, the guy, Dr. Udrahai, who was in charge of the residency program, was also in charge of cultural affairs at the hospital. And uh, after we talked for a while, somehow we started talking about classical music, and we talked for over an hour about different composers, conductors, their styles, orchestras, orchestral halls. He was on cloud nine, and there was no way he wasn't taking <laughs> me in the program, because <laughs> he had to have somebody to discuss this with. And, and I love to tell young people that there's no such thing as useless knowledge, because you, you don't know when it's going to open up doors for you. And, you know, when I was learning all that stuff, you know, black kid in Motown, listening to Motown, mm -hmm. kids thought I was nuts. But, you know, I always say, the more you know, the more valuable you become. Uh, and the more doors it can open up for you. And some people say, but you'll overload your brain. You well, I can tell you as a brain surgeon, you cannot overload your brain. It is impossible. The average human brain could contain all the knowledge and every volume that was ever written in the history of the world and have plenty of room left over, so you just can't do it. So really, just drop that one off the table in terms of a worry. Do you listen to classical music in the, in the OR? I do. All the residents know when they come to pediatric neurosurgery that they're going to get asked about classical music <laughs> as well as about the function of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the brain because you are still obviously in awe of the brain. This, this thing that is, is considered to be more complex than any natural or artificial thing on earth. Well, you know, the human brain, you know, billions and billions of neurons. I mean, if you start it from as soon as you learn how to count until you die counting the neurons, you wouldn't even get close to the number of neurons that we have. Um, hundreds of billions of interconnections. Uh, it can uh, calculate and process more than two million bits of information in one second. It remembers everything you've ever seen and everything you've ever heard. It is the source of creation of all the things that we marvel at. The, the computers, the television cameras, the space shuttle, all that comes from the human brain. Uh, so, you know, when, when people start talking about what they can't do, they really are not thinking about what they really have between their ears. And every time I look at that thing, I'm so impressed. You know, I was asked by an NPR uh, correspondent not too long ago. She said, Dr. Carson, I noticed that you don't talk much about race. Why is that? And I said, it's because I'm a neurosurgeon. And she gave me a quizzical look. And I said, you see, when I go into the operating room and I peel back that scalp and I take off that skull, I'm actually working on a thing that makes that person who they are. I say, the covering really isn't that important. The brain is what makes us who we are. And yet people always refer to you as the first black neurosurgeon to do this or do that. And in many cases, you were the first neurosurgeon, period, to do things. And in and, and most of the cases where uh, there's been brown breaking things, yeah, it has nothing to do with race. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why people get so fixated on things that don't make a difference, you know. What I always say is, I believe that we had a, a wonderful creator who gave us variety. I said, can you imagine how horrible and how boring it would be if everybody looked exactly like you? <laughs> so, you know, that's a good thing, but certainly not a thing to spend so much time and energy on. And one of the great examples I like to give is ants. I say, who always comes to a party uninvited? Ants. You got a group of black ants, a group of red ants, and it's good they're there because they need to clean up all those, those crumbs, but they see each other, and what do they do? They fight. Why? Because one's red and one's black. Now, have you ever done a craniotomy on an ant? Take an ant, put his head under a dissecting microscope. You've done this? Open it up <laughs> and look for his brain. You're going to be looking for a long time. <laughs> That's their excuse. <laughs> What's their excuse? <laughs> uh, 
you, I want to get back for a moment to uh, to the fact that you specialize. You you are a pediatric uh, neurosurgeon. Um, we're talking about very small brains, and and part of I think, aside from the fact that that the results of your success mm -hmm. can be forty or fifty years, um, there's a plasticity you mm -hmm. talk about to young brains. Right. So you can even remove half of a brain, literally. Exactly. And this person becomes a functioning human being. And 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 that's because the immature brain has many neurons that haven't quite differentiated or decided what they want to do when they grow up yet. And they can be recruited to do other things. So you can recruit many of the cells on the opposite side of the brain to take over the function of the removed side or the severely damaged side. But that only happens up to a certain age. Uh, so that doesn't work in the mature brain and in the adult brain. And that's one of the things that attracted me to pediatrics. You could do some rather unique and radical things to solve some unique and radical problems that you would not be able to do with adults. But as, as we learn more and we study more about plasticity, and particularly as we, as we begin to understand how to use stem cells in an appropriate way, there will be ways in the future that we can bring plasticities to adults. So an adult who's had a stroke, who's had a severe traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury, I have no doubt that in the future we will be able to restore that function. Some say that we are approaching the study of the brain the way we uh, have approached uh, learning about the universe. And I'm wondering, are there things on the horizon in terms of some of the uh, diseases and, and tumors and problems that you work on that you see light at the end of the tunnel? You see an answer, a real answer on the horizon. Absolutely. You know, I've, I've been in neurosurgery now for 32 years, a long time. And it's a very different specialty now than it was when I started. And 30 years from now, it'll be completely different than it is now. You know, you, you look at some of the imaging capabilities that we have now, uh, which allow us to pinpoint precise areas of the brain and look at the metabolic activity that is going on in that area of the brain and use an external source of energy to ablate uh, or, or to destroy uh, an area that needs to be removed without actually cutting into a person. You know, these kinds of things are in their infancy. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of the Star Trek episode with the whales. I think it was Star Trek Three, And they found a human skull, you know, from the 1990s. And it had evidence of a craniotomy. And, and they were saying, can you believe those barbarians back <laughs> in those days, what they used to do? <laughs> well, you know, we, 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 we are approaching those kinds of things. You look at the, the various things that can be done with an endoscope, with something, uh, you know, no, no bigger than a pencil or less that can be placed into cavities in the brain to look around inside, to remove tissue, uh, to coagulate abnormal vessels, to do a whole host of things, to divert fluid to another area. Uh, these, these are just amazing things. And that's not to say that there aren't still primitive tools in your toolkit, drills and saws and things that would, would make most people shudder. Well, it, it is kind of funny. I remember once there was a Reader's Digest uh, reporter who wanted to come to the operating room and I said, are you sure you're going to be able to, oh yeah, I was in Vietnam. And, you know, took the drill and started drilling into the head and next thing we know, thud, he was <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> but it's really not that bad. You get used to it. Uh, some, some neuroscientists describe themselves really as, as uh, you know, scientists on one hand but mechanics on the other. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I frequently say, you know, being a neurosurgeon in, in many cases like being a plumber uh, because, for instance, in people who have hydrocephalus or fluid on the brain, and you know, we have to put in a shunt to divert the fluid from the brain to the abdomen or to the lungs or to the heart or to some other part of, of the body that can absorb the fluid. So that's, that's very similar to a plumber. And, uh, you know, we may not make as much money as plumbers, but, you know, it's, it's very similar to what they do. <laughs> How do you get over, um, y you've talked in, in your book, uh, Gifted Hands, the story of Ben Carson, you talk about surgeries that were incredibly complex 
and that were successful and yet your patients died. I'm thinking of, of twins from Germany who after the successful surgery one child aspirated on food and I think suffered brain damage, another right. died. How do you get over that? Well, you know, anytime something doesn't work out, the way you can get by it is knowing that you did the best that you can do and recognizing that you're not ultimately in charge of everything. Uh, in my case, I believe in a higher power than myself. And I believe that, that my duty is to do the very best that I can do with the abilities that have been given to me. Now, does that mean that I don't feel it when somebody dies or somebody has a bad result? Of course I feel it. Uh, and of course it hurts. But you're able to move on because you know, you've done your best and that you can't sit there and, and become you know, uh, ineffective because you're worried about that. You've taken on some cases that other neurosurgeons has, have said, I'm not touching this, it's too risky. There's sort of a four-prong question that you ask yourself, and, right. and you really are very serious about weighing risks and benefits. Well, yes. What is that four-point? Well, I ask myself, what's the best thing that happens if I do this, and what's the worst thing that happens if I do it? What's the best thing that happens if I don't do it, and what's the worst thing that happens if I don't do it? And by analyzing the answers to those four questions, I can frequently, very quickly, decide whether this is something that's worthwhile. If I then decide that it's worthwhile, I frequently will ask another series of questions. Who, what, when, where, how, why? <laughs> Who's it affecting? All those kinds of things. But you need to have a good mechanism for sorting things out. And in and, and some of the cases where, uh, you know, people have thought maybe I was a bit of a maverick, it's not that I was a maverick at all. It's because I, I asked those questions. Uh, one well-known pediatric neurosurgeon once said, Carson will operate on anybody who will lay down, uh, which is not true because I operate on people in the sitting position too. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, the fact of the matter is I would, I would ask those questions. And, and if this person had absolutely no chance if we didn't do something, but maybe a small chance if we did, you know, I'd sit down with the parents, I'd talk about that, I said, you know, the chances really are not good if we do something, but the chances are virtually zero if we do nothing. And fortunately, in, in many of those cases, things worked out well. There was one case uh, that I'm curious about. It was 29-year-old Iranian twins yes. joined at the back of the head. They wanted desperately to be separated. Yes. Uh, a sur surgeons in, in Germany said no. Um, and, and you took on the case. Well, I didn't, actually. When they actually, you were part of a team, I right. should say. When I'm they sorry. When they first came to me, I, I told them about Chang and Ying Bunker and how they lived to be 63 years old without being separated, and they were having no parts of that they wanted to be separated. So they found a team in Singapore, Right. Uh, a team with whom I was familiar and had worked with before. And, uh, and then that team subsequently uh, you know, convinced me to come and help them. I, even though I wasn't particularly game to do so. That's how that worked Oh, out. okay. <laughs> and, and of course that, that ended tragically, but, you were, but, but that team was fulfilling their wish to try. Right. They, you know, they said something to me that, that really struck me. They said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck together. And that seemed incredibly harsh to me. But then I put myself in their shoes and I said, you know, yeah, what if you were stuck to somebody 24-7 and you could never get away from them for one second and the two of you had very different very aspirations? Different. That probably would be worse than that. So I, at that point, fully understood where they were coming from. And then I was, I was more at ease with it. What percentage of the patients that you see um, require uh, medical assistance? I, I, what I'm wondering, you and your wife started Angels of the OR, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how many patients you have to turn away because they don't have the means, or you have to come up with, a, with another um, philanthropic fund to be able to treat them. Well, uh, it's, it's my hope that now that we're engaged in this healthcare debate, that 
pretty soon angels of the OR will be irrelevant that we won't have to be worried about that. But, you know, there, there are a number of patients who uh, may have insurance, but they're underinsured. It won't take care of a certain procedure or a certain test, or they may have some travel issues. And, you know, we just felt that it would be horrible if they couldn't get done what needed to be done, you know, because of a matter of five or ten, fifteen thousand dollars here or there, and that was that was the purpose of of creating this organization, so that we could fill in the gap to allow these families, both adult and children. One of the adult uh, neurosurgeons that, that is a close friend of mine, Dr. Cliff Solomon, uh, and myself, we've both been agonizing over this, and we combined forces to create Angels of the OR. And uh, but we are we are both hoping that we really will get some meaningful health reform and that it, it will become irrelevant, but it's still there. People from all over the world have, have sought out your services and, and there have been instances where you've said, yes, I will take on this case. I'm thinking of a young African boy who needed brain surgery, um, but you can't speak for your, for your, o, for your OR. Um, yeah, well, in the, in, in the early part of my career, it was actually pretty easy to do those kinds of cases, uh, to do charity cases, and we all did a ton of charity cases. Uh, but what happened about 10 years ago is that hospitals no longer had this big cushion that they used to have because reimbursements, you know, kept going down, 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 down. So, you know, most places are sort of working on the edge now. So, you know, the, the answer I would get when I wanted to do a charity case is, yeah, you can give your time away, but can you give away anesthesia's time and the ICU and the physical therapist and nursing? And, and of course, the answer is no. Uh, so, you know, that's something that has changed pretty dramatically. And, and uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know or don't understand is that, you know, the indigent always used to be taken care of. Uh, virtually every physician devoted a portion of their practice to taking care of indigent people. So they always got taken care of. Um, but now a lot of physicians don't take care of them because they're too busy <laughs> struggling with the system. And uh, so we, we've actually taken something that used to take care of itself and made it into something that doesn't. Uh, having said that, I do think there should be a formal way of taking care of it, but it needs to be done in a logical way, like we discussed before. It's perfectly uh, easy for us as a society to take care of these things, paying much less money than we pay now, if we will just exercise a little more logic and a little less politics. Your biological father must know about you, know about your successes. Um, he was a much older man than your mother who was 13 when she married him. She was, he was a, a Baptist minister from, from Tennessee. And as you said, he was a bigamist and had a family of his own. Have you reconnected with him? Well, you know, he, he died many years ago. But, uh, yeah, I uh, have never been bitter toward him. And, you know, he, he was at my wedding and, you know. But, you know, he did not play a substantial role in my life and even though as a kid I was very I was de I was devastated when my parents got divorced uh, it's like somebody pulled the rug out from underneath there. I prayed every night that they would get back together but you know later in life I realized that had he been there with the influence that he provided I probably would not have become the person that I did because you know, he was into carousing, uh, womanizing, all these kinds of influences that I th I'm sure would have been deleterious. So, you know, sometimes, you know, as, you know, we can't really see the big picture and we're saying, oh, this is one, but if, if we could see down the road, we would see that maybe this is for the better. Speaking of the big picture, that's the title of, of one of your four books. Uh, and in it, you pose a question that you think we all need to ask ourselves so that we're focusing on the right things. And one of the th questions that you say, aside from where do you want to be 5, 10, 20 years from now, right. is how do you want to be remembered? Yes. How would you answer that? Well, I would like to be remembered as a person who helped people to understand 
the incredible potential that they had and to help people realize that they really don't have to depend on a lot of other people. Uh, what they have to do is take advantage of their God-given talents and to develop those and that the person who has the most to do with them and what happens to them is them based on the choices that they make. And if you can get people to understand that and you can abolish that victim mentality, you're going to have an army of very capable people. Um, and I, I look at all the things that were invented uh, in this country and you know the, the more I read about the history of our nation the more impressed I am about who we are and what kind of people we are as the world's only superpower um, how benign we are compared to other superpowers that have been here uh, the tremendous good that has been done you know throughout the world and, you know, I don't have a whole lot of patience for those people who sit around and bash the United States. Are we perfect? No. But we're a heck of a lot better than anybody else who's ever occupied this position. And we have the potential to get even better. And we need not to be bashing ourselves, but to be looking at the, the kind of innovation, the kind of can-do attitude that made us into a great nation that allowed us to reach the pinnacle faster than any other nation in the history of the world. We don't need to be trying to become like everybody else. We need to be who we are. We need to lead in a reasonable and responsible fashion. Dr. Ben Carson, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Ben Carson. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.